Hey, welcome back to the channel. All right, it is time for the January trending. I am extremely excited about this video in particular. There are timestamps in the description, so if you want to jump through it, there's a lot covered in this one. Feel free to go to them in the description and they will right there and take you to where you want to be. We're going to very quickly talk about Mysterio. I have this up for a reason. And then I'm going to get into a bit of a roundtable interview with DLL and Campo, two of the um, two of the guys that are on the rankings team. These are channels I watch and have watched for a very long time to get better at this game. I cannot recommend more that you subscribe to them and listen to this all the way through. We are going to talk about Sigil Witch. I know the ability to dupe her from the store is coming up. It is definitely on people's mind. A lot of the folks in my members chat have been asking me about that. So we're going to discuss that in pretty good detail. Hyperion, he's actually available as a six star now. Is he as good as we remember him being? What are our thoughts on him in the meta? How excited are you if you pull him? We will talk about solo mode, relics, and on the day of recording it, Kabam updated how the crystals will work as far as when a champion will be coming into the basic pool. I do think that has meaningful ramifications for crystals and how you want to go about allocating your resources. And then for Kang, more of us have Kang now thanks to the gifting event. He went from a zero to a hero as long as you pair him with Apocalypse. Obviously, he can do things in questing. How does that work out, though, when you're trying to really plan out a war? We're talking like high tier war. And then we will talk about his usage in questing as well. All right. Mysterio, um, a member in my uh, on my, my YouTube channel did notice that in the last video, I had the icon that I would talk about Mysterio. He was moved slightly down. He is still in the super premium tier, meaning if you want to rank through him, if you're like, hey, dude, I just pulled him. Should I rank through the champion? And I'll say, yes, yes, you should. If you have the Penny Parker synergy, the only reason Mysterio was moved down in that tier is because he does require that synergy. And this is not exactly the same as Cable and Apocalypse because Apocalypse is a top shelf mutant champion. He's one of the best, if not the best mutant champions in the game. So you are not being penalized in any way, shape or form by taking along Apocalypse to have your Cable be a fantastic, phenomenal champion. So that pairing is exceptional. It's top shelf. Penny, while a excellent champion and one of the ones that I believe got moved above Mysterio, is very, very good. She's not Apocalypse. So not that you're not that you're paying like a heavy price to bring along Penny in order to uh, supercharge your Mysterio, but it is something to be aware of. It is obviously a little bit more difficult to do in War when you only have three spots available. It's slightly more easy to do in Questing when you have five, but at the end of the day, often you find yourself wanting to make use of all five of those champions. That's it. I will talk more about uh, champions and these sorts of things in the next rankings video, which will be coming out in February. I'm very excited for that. We have quite a few new additions. And then now let's get to the round table. All right. And as promised, I have brought on experts from the rankings team. I'm sure you know both of them, but if you do not, please go do yourself a favor, check out their channels. We have Daddy Longlegs, I'll be calling him DLL, and Campo. Both of them are BG leaders in Masters War Tier Alliance SSX. They are BG leaders and war planners, and they know a ton about this game. Thank you so much for joining me, uh, guys. I appreciate you being here today. Yeah, sure thing. Happy to be here. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Of course. So uh, we have quite a few things that we're going to talk over today. I think we have about five, four or five topics. I will do my best to leave timestamps in the description in case one of them interests you and the others are not as interesting to you. But uh, well, let's go ahead and get started. The first one, and I did get most of these questions from the members chat in uh, my Discord server. So members of my YouTube channel, I asked them, what you know, what's going on? What's kind of quote unquote trending in the game? And this was this was immediate. This jumped to the top and I was surprised by it. Um, was the SIG ability on Sigil Witch and more so apparently this week or next week, a lot of people who've had the Sigil for a while are going to have the ability to dupe her uh, through their, I can't think of what the currency is called, and purchase her. I am um, I really like this champion. And DLL, I know you mentioned her in your kind of essential war attackers. Um, I don't want to, I'll let you kind of talk that through a bit more. She seems to definitely have value. I'm looking at the SIG, and the thing that keeps standing out to me, if I'm reading it correctly, though, is you don't know what you're going to get. But uh, these things will be happening 
pretty frequently, if I'm understanding it correctly. Campo, I think you've had a bit more time to kind of think about this. What are, what are your thoughts? Because there's kind of twofold there is one, what do you see as the value of the SIG and, and its practicality and usability in the game? And then two, is it worth using uh, that currency that you're building up? And I'll tell you, my hesitation is in two or three months is Kabam going to put out another champion you can get through the Sigil store. So uh, there's a lot there, but I'd really like to, to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, well, I like a couple things about the SIG. Um, the whole build and design of this character is sort of randomness and chaos as it is. Um, so, you know, there's no guarantee of getting the specific buffs that you want currently. And basically what the SIG does is at the same time that you have, uh, what is it called? Chaos uh, Surge. When you have those, you also get a chance to play some debuffs. And the thing I like about the SIG is that the chance is a flat 20% and that's not what scales with the SIG. The thing that actually scales with it is the potency. So even at SIG 20, I do think it may have some value, but like you hinted it at, there is a little bit of randomness. So like you can't guarantee that you're gonna get a Petrify or an armor break at any given moment. But the fact that they come up, maybe if you run Despair, that can be helpful. I mean, I think I don't personally have the Sigil, so I don't have my first copy of her, but I do think I would spend the currency to get her because it does seem to unlock a new facet to her kit, in my opinion. What about you, DL? And, and if I'm reading this correctly, guys, it, it's saying this should happen every time this 20% chance is on right. activation of all Chaos Surges. And then as you were talking about, uh, Campo, Chaos Surge happens every four seconds. Right. So that, that's pretty frequent. And it is a 20% chance per instability. And from my understanding of the way that you want to play her kit, you are trying to basically be at five instability all the time. Yeah. Because that gives you the 100% chance for something to happen every four seconds. But you don't want to go any higher because that's when it turns into that DJ. Yeah, I did a I did an initial video on her and there was a way of playing her where you could kind of you could stay at five pretty consistently, uh, if right. I remember correctly. So what are you thinking then, DLL, as far as as far as going through the value on this in and of itself, and then should people be spending their currency on it? I do plan on awakening her because that's like the one piece of reliable spending I do is the sigil. I think it's very good value, and especially for the inventory space. I don't necessarily recommend it to anyone who's not spending, but if you're spending, it's good value. Because if I'm playing her, I'm going to want access to that, and because the way I'm playing her normally, because I want the buffs to be guaranteed, should mean that I'm also guaranteed to get one of these effects, I want to have it. But I don't think I'm going to feed her because the problem is that it's ore. Yeah. And that means that like if I'm taking a power control match with her or a you know a healing control match with her, then I have a hundred percent chance every four seconds to maybe get three seconds of something relevant. But like if it's a if it if it's the exact same chance for both then I could very easily have that coin land on heads three times in a row and get three armor breaks over that course of 12 seconds and have the SIG do nothing for the fight that I want it to. Yeah. And on the flip side, if I'm fighting somebody like Killmonger, maybe I keep getting the petrified. And then that'll just feed him power. <laughs> so that's not good. Yeah. Less power, but still, like, yeah. yeah, it's not the armor break you want. <laughs> right. That's what that's where I'm falling. Like, I mean, you're you're making great points, both of you. Um, and the thing for me that I keep coming back to is there you guys point out they're only for three seconds, and you're yeah. still not sure which one you're going to get. And the thing I liked about this champion was that there is some quote unquote chaos. I like how they played into that. But you can kind of control it. In fact, I think I wrote on the thumbnail like controlled chaos or something of that of that nature. To me, there's nothing you can control here. Like there's, this is purely a, something cool may happen. And for me, at least the, uh, my skill level, uh, like let's say the power sting comes on. 
you have three seconds to try to maybe get the defender to throw a special. Mm hmm. Because uh, there wouldn't be a stun, right, if it runs its duration? Or it doesn't even have a duration. Do we, do we know what would happen with the power sing if they don't throw a special? Nothing. I assume yeah, that's, just fall that's off. special yeah. to a yellow jacket. Correct, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and compare that with the buffs, which in terms of what you're saying about controllable chaos, they last 12 seconds. Yeah. So if you really need a prowess then every four seconds you have a chance to get a prowess. And when you eventually do get a prowess, it lasts three cycles. If these all lasted 12 seconds and you just needed, okay, every like third cycle, I need to hit petrify or armor break to stay on top of this particular fight. Yeah. Then this would be absolutely amazing. And I think I'd... Yeah. If the SIG had any kind of scaling, like even if it went up to like, I don't know, six seconds at SIG 200, then I think it would feel pretty valuable to me. But as it is, I'm not that excited. Yeah, I think um, I think what what everyone will, what you all will end up seeing me do, and I do think I may be taking her to rank three in the not too distant future, is you're going to see me wait now uh, on on awakening her with my uh, resource, uh, my currency here. Uh, now, I, I've played this game long enough, though, where I sometimes err on holding on too long for things. Like, I'm always anticipating, like, oh, the next great thing's coming. Uh, like, you even heard me say it a few minutes ago. Kabam will put out the next great Sigil champion. They're coming. I know it. Like, uh, Jessica Jones or what have you, right? Um, but I think that's what I'm going to do. Campo, uh, as you said, you don't have the Sigil. But if you did, what do you think ultimately you would do? I think you guys are slightly convincing me to wait. And I think the thing that just came to my head is it kind of depends on roster development too, because I have Dr. Doom, Sorcerer Supreme, Tigra. I actually just ranked Man Thing. Like I have a very stacked Mystic roster. So the chances of me using Sigil Witch in something meaningful is, is kind of low. So I guess I would do it for like kind of my addiction to Platinum Stars. <laughs> yeah. Um, but other than that, yeah, I don't think this is going to be the make or break. Like, oh, now that I have this ability, I'm taking her into war instead of Doom or Tigra or something, you know? So I, I don't know. That, you, this is the first I've heard of people saying, like, maybe wait. And I think you guys may have convinced me, you know, again, if I had Sigil. But yeah, good arguments made on both sides, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, about, yeah DL. Sorry, go on. No, definitely. I, I was headed to you. I was going to say, I don't plan to wait, but it's part the silver star thing i'll fully admit yeah and part because i just think that it would be like incidental value because when petrifies yeah. show up you know maybe it's just a few seconds of reversing healing maybe it's just reversing willpower because i also run despair maybe the power sting does nothing heal blocks are usually helpful but like you know a chance for the armor break to happen right before i throw the special three and gain like 5,000 extra attack because I'm nullifying five buffs. An armor break could really matter there, even if it's a weak one, even if I have to time it right. It feels like it's enough for me to invest the sigil currency in, but not enough to invest six stones in. Fair. And one more thing, I, yeah. um, incursions. I think just having debuffs in general can sometimes help you with some of those tactics. So if, you know, that's a kind of a secondary use, but that could be kind of cool if you put on that one where you get more attack per unique debuff. Maybe you stack a couple debuffs that could interact with the hacks in an interesting way. Yeah, I, I think that I, uh, everything you all said made a lot of sense. And it, so if anyone, if you're a viewer, if you have a question on this, uh, go ahead and ask it in the comments and we'll do our best to get to it. Uh, all right, so let's move on to the next one. DLL, we're going to start with you because you know, you and I have known each other since War Season 1. And you have been a Hyperion. Uh, you were a Hyperion main, I guess, right? I, I think that was possible maybe at the time. You're doing a lot yeah. of great things with him anyway, so let's, let's call it that. Uh, we do the rankings uh, every month. <clears throat> I've been doing it for, you know, 13, 14 months now. And he's always been one of my top Cosmics. But he wasn't available as a six star. And so a lot of it was, well, the five star can still do these things. Here's all the great things, the passive power gain. I mean, he is an awesome champion in no way, shape or form, no matter how this conversation turns out. Do I want anyone to walk away thinking like, oh, Hyperion's not good. He is excellent. 
but he's finally now in the six star featured crystal. We have a real chance to get him. And the thing that keeps happening for me when I'm opening those crystals is while I do want Hyperion, I've noticed that maybe there's other champions I, I want more and it's not just purely out of fun or a desire to just add them to my roster. They're ones that I think may help my roster more uh, uh, in a way. And I'm not sure I would instantly take him to rank three, which has been very, very surprising for me. I, I, there's no specific question as far as like, where do you rank him? Where do you rate him? I, I, I think that's, you know, we can cover that. And as we say all the time, one champion is not always going to be better than another it's in this game. It's just way too complex. But where do you see Hyperion fitting in the meta as you've been through 7.2 and 7.3? You're playing Masters Tier War. You're doing incursions. If you were to pull the six star, how do you see that actually playing out? Where do you see his value and, and that sort of thing? This is a tough one for me because okay. I, I've i had some of the same thoughts that you have. I mean, to give kind of the credentials here, Hyperion was one of my primary two characters for exploring Labyrinth of Legends. It was him and Blade, and I used Hype for more fights than I did Blade. Wow. He was my primary attacker through all of Act 5, a huge chunk of Act 6. He was one of my two go-tos as a Rank 5 in Master's Level War, for a long time. I brought him almost every war to take somebody on the old node 29. Like I've, I've used him more than most. And I feel the same way. I'm honestly not sure he's fully held up because the power gain is still great. Um, like the, the buffs lasting longer can be helpful. I mean, you definitely want the dupe, but there's just a fair amount of chance in him. Like, the stun is not guaranteed, the incinerates are not guaranteed, the theories are not guaranteed, and with the way the AI behaves these days, holding block for long enough to activate his regen, even if you're in cosmic overcharge and you're not going to, like, doom yourself to have no power gain for a long period of time, it's a 30% heal and you still may not get all of it back because maybe you just block a bunch of three hit heavy or three hit combos and then they throw a heavy and you never get the heal. And so finally, by the time you do, it's just, he isn't quite what he was. And I think that you can still get a lot of value out of him. I think that especially at a high skill cap, if you are comfortable finding spots to throw his heavy where you can't necessarily just parry, then that's huge. Like, one of the reasons that I feel like I'm good with Tigra is because of skills I picked up using Hyperion so much. So there's some overlap there, and there's still a lot this guy can do. He can still hit very high um, levels of damage output. He still has energy resistance. He gains physical resistance. But the thing is that, like, to truly make him look ridiculous, you kind of have to use teams that make any cosmic look ridiculous these days. And so I think he's well above average, but I... I think I was more excited to pull Cersei than him, and that makes me really sad on some level. Yeah. I think one thing that's really big about this is that you guys both know... A lot of my recent rank-ups, I've talked about how they fit really well into teams I already have. Like, Cersei fits well with Reed and Invisible Woman. She fits well with Hercules. I took up Hawkeye because he fits well with Tigra, Jabari, also with Hercules. Like, I'm so... I'm so focused on, like, if I bring all of these characters together, are they going to be greater than the sum of their parts? And for so many champions lately, that's true. And as you just looked ahead, Hyperion has synergies that are appropriate for how old he is, and they do almost nothing. Uh, and just to, uh, as a point of clarification, because I, I, you know, not everyone may know and, and know the tiers and all those things. You're not saying that you think Cersei is necessarily a better champion than Hyperion. It's about fitting into your roster. If I, I want to make sure I understood that. Yes, completely. Because out of the Cosmics I have, like, I have Surfer, Odin, Cosmic Ghost Rider, all at rank three. Oh, and Hercules, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and 
I don't think that Hyperion adds a ton on top of those four. The main thing is the power gain and the healing, and Odin with his Energize and Cosmic Ghost Rider with his power gain can get some of that benefit. And so then it's just healing, and I just talked about how bad that often feels these days with the modern AI. And so I feel like even though Cersei may not be as strong a champion in an absolute sense, she probably adds significantly more to my roster. Yeah. And we're dealing with big rosters. And thanks for bringing up like who we actually have, Kemp. I know you did that too. Um, and Kemp, what do you, basically the same exact question for you in regard to Hyperion. Yeah. So I used Hyperion a decent amount for Act 6. I would say. Captain America Infinity War and Hyperion were by far the MVPs for like 6.1 and 6.2 when I was coming up through the game. And actually one of your members, who's a common friend of ours, Mobius, he's yeah. the first person that got me hooked on Hyperion. He he got him from like the original featured crystal. So big shout out to uh, one of your, your members. Um, but yeah, so for me, I found myself using Hyperion if it was a situation where I needed to like spam special one and just load them out with incinerates. And like, I remember in act six, there were some electros and things like that where the nodes were just horrible. And the only way I could think about getting around it was just that constant power gain and just like continually doing L1, which has like the little slap that's a physical hit, but then the rest of it's projectiles. So electro doesn't get back at you. That's my memory of using him. And obviously he does a lot more like labyrinth clearing and stuff. But when I'm thinking about act seven and if I would need sort of a cheesy ability like that, it seems like they're building nodes that play into the strengths of the class of cosmic class. And like, I'm having a ton of fun right now with silver surfer, with Odin pre-fights, with red goblin, with CGR and things like that. And I don't think I would choose Hyperion over them. So I'm kind of in the same feeling as everyone here i still think he's an amazing champ i'll probably put him to rank two until a day when rank three in a cosmic is so easy that he'll join my rank three ranks but i'm not in a huge rush to do it if i pull him you know it's interesting for me like it, and it's always helpful to hear other smart players especially players who i think are smarter about the game than i am talk through these things because it helps me put words into the way i think i'm feeling and one of the things that keeps coming up is like other options. But we're going through it and I'm like, no, he's got things I love about a champion, like this massive power gain, the ability to place uh, and incinerate this debuff off the SP1, a potential stun. Dale, Dale brings up a great point, though, that's, you know, the 60%. Uh, and then he's got this fury buff that will continue to grow as you rank him. And I'm wondering this is if I pull him, I might not instantly rank three him and it might take a while. But when rank four start to be more common, like I, I just, I'm just throwing a number out, but like I'm at like rank four, 12, 12 through 15, I could see him skipping potentially. I, I think it's reasonable to think I may take him from two to four as opposed to taking some of these other rank threes. Like uh, I just took Venom pull up who I do really like, but I could see me potentially skipping Venom pool or, or maybe even Venom to bring Hyperion to rank four first. I mean, who knows what the game will be throwing us at that time, but I'm also wondering that because I just still think he is an excellently made champion that can handle so many of the problems. Maybe that the game throws at us, maybe the issue though is that the problems the game throws at us have kind of moved on to not more niche champions, but to borrow DLL's term, champions that are filling a design space and Kabam's the one who ultimately decides what that design space is. Um, just real quick, I wanted to hear what you guys maybe thought about that idea and then just give you a final chance, a chance to kind of give a, a last few seconds on the Hyperion topic. We'll go, we'll start with Campo this time. Um, yeah, now that you say it, I don't know why, but it does seem logical to me that like him as a rank three, uh, not the most exciting thing for me, but like a rank four Hyperion, ooh, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I do think that sometimes these old champs that were the old gods do make a renaissance. You know, certainly magic has never really lost her value. And Archangel made a huge comeback maybe like a year, year and a half ago to the point where he's one of the dominant champs in the game again. 
So maybe we're just waiting for that renaissance for Hyperion and you know, when more people have them, have him, they can kind of showcase some of the things that he does. I mean, that the power gain alone is so OP. Like that ability, like you could do nothing and just throw special threes for days. Not that you would play him that way, but like no other champ can really do that currently. So yeah, I mean, he's he's Hyperion, man. So yeah, I could see I could see people ranking him and, and no shade thrown if you totally disagree with me here. No, I... I personally completely agree because I there are a number of layers to this. One, I have tried using Hyperion in incursions, and one thing that always bothers me when we get to late rooms is effectively his status as a five star because yeah. his challenge rating really starts to hurt him. He doesn't crit anymore, he's taking more damage through block, he doesn't have access to adrenaline. If he gets hit, he's probably going to get crit and it's like reduce, I think it might reduce his resistances. I, please don't quote me on that. But it just makes him really fragile and he has a tough time punching up, which is weird given the design of the champion, but just because of the way challenge rating works, it's true. And if you apply that logic to the rank four thing, then by the time you're taking him to rank four, you know, he's going to crit more often. He's going to be crit less often. He's going to have better block proficiency. He's going to have adrenaline period, which is going to be amazing for any blocking or parries that you have to do with his play style, all of those ways to get heavies in. And he's going to have increased combat power rate. And that may yeah. sound silly, because we're talking about like, oh, it's Hyperion, you don't gain power from like landing his hits, but that's what makes him nuts is that you do. There are so many other champions with passive power gain where they're also, um, they also have reduced combat power rate. And so they have to wait to get to the same, you know, payoff. Hype doesn't. And that was one of the things that I felt made me a particularly good Hyperion player back when I used him in war was I felt like I really was on top of the interplay between his power gains and how much I was going to gain with each combo. And at rank three, he's not going to have quite as much as I'm used to at rank five. Rank four would be closer. So all of those factors added together, plus the fact that he could be sig 20 and still be a valuable sixth rank four or if you don't care about prestige hell first or second yeah like yeah so, i i agree with you i could easily see him making the leapfrog from rank two to rank four and you know it's funny as i'm realizing the the question that people are probably wanting to to ask and so i'll ask it real quick we'll do quick answers then we'll move on to the next topic is so uh, uh you know i'm your typical summoner right like maybe these the rosters aren't quite as large as the ones that we've accumulated um, I pull six star Hyperion. Am I excited? Should I be excited? In your opinion, we'll go. Uh, sorry, yes. with DLL. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I mean, we both yeah. said yes. <laughs> yeah. So the it's an short answer yes. is yes. Okay. But I think these days he's more of a yes along the lines of Killmonger or Tigra or certain, maybe even Shang Chi. Where my next question is: Are you willing to put in the time? That's a good point. Okay. Is this, this is not Hercules. <laughs> no, I, I mean, great point. <laughs> I use that analogy all the time now. That's like, really, who is? Mm -hmm. um, all right, so let's move on to our third topic, which is going to be about uh, solo mode, uh, relics, and then something that I think relates with this topic. We just, it just was a fortuitous timing here. We get um, this, uh, oh, where did it go here? Let me find it, guys. We get this message today uh, that Kitty Pride, I mean, everyone can read it, but starting with the addition of the six star Kitty Pride, the crystals, new champions will have their six star rarities added along their three to five when they are added to the base, uh, base pool for possible champions. So the way I'm understanding this and DL and Campo did have to kind of explain it to me a bit, uh, translate Kabam to languages I understand better. This means that champions will come to the crystal a little bit more quickly or to the basic crystal. Is that is that the a good synopsis guys you think? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, which is good, right? Earlier access to this, and both of you pointed out real quickly, though, because my thought was like, you still have like what a one in two hundred chance of getting them. Like that's nice, but 
Uh, but you brought up that this will significantly increase, I don't know if significantly, but will increase the um, value of Nexus crystals. That that makes sense to me, right? Because you have you're increasing your odds. So I guess this real topic really is more the quote unquote future of the game. We don't know what solo mode or relics exactly will be yet. We had a bit of a showcase with it with the Summoner Showdown. What are you guys excited about? Like when you think about this, the future of the game and for, and for now, like, yes, we all understand the game engine needs to be updated. It has to, right? Uh, so let's talk more about the possible exciting things in the solo mode relics and then things like this crystal, how you feel they relate. It's a pretty broad, open-ended one. And I'm curious to see where you guys take it. Uh, we'll, we'll start with DLL on this one. Yeah, so I mean, I think this is probably a positive change. I could see it having warped the value of the feature crystal back when there was a smaller pool. But these days, if you're opening a feature crystal, it's like 4% and change for the particular champion you want. Whereas if you're opening a basic for this crystal that's now in there, it's like less than half a percent chance. So I think the features still earn their premium, which is probably an important reason why Kabam has decided to do this. Because they're not necessarily devaluing the feature and they can still you know shards will still have value that way but like you said this really opens up nexuses and i think it also makes abyss a bit more interesting because you remember when i finished abyss yeah. i picked mutant and held on to it until apocalypse and professor x were added on the same day if That's kitty true. was what mattered to me you may have just given her you may have just given me an opportunity to get her months earlier so let, let me ask this question, guys. Uh, Campo, I do want to hear what you say, and, and DL, I realize I may have interrupted you. Um, but I want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly and that viewers can understand this. The way you're reading this is, if you can see my screen, if you guys are looking at it, the five-star featured crystal is going to turn over in about eight, 18 days, right? 17 days, 23 hours, and eight, 18 minutes. When that happens, Kitty Pride and Nimrod, from best I can tell, will be added to the basic six star crystal. Is that? No. No, okay. Because if you go back to the home screen, it's actually not when the five star feature um, turns over. It's a set number of weeks after their release, they add, oh man, they removed it. Yeah, I think um, it might be in here though. Who was the latest? Yeah. Was Penny, is Kitty in the basic yet? Or is, is, was Penny the last one? Oh, added? you know what you can do is um, go to the basic six star crystal. There you go, yeah. And the preview of the reel will tell you, like, uh, or not the, the basic five-star crystal. It helps if I'm on the right page. Did I scroll by it already? Yeah. There it is. Red one. So okay, like so Penny. penny. Um... It's okay. We don't need to. It'll take us a while to backtrack to figure out exactly who and when. But so when they get added to this crystal, which is not related to the five star featured crystal, but when they get added to this crystal, whether they're in the six star featured crystal or not, they will get added to uh, the six star basic. Yeah. Did I explain that right? right. Okay. Yeah, currently the basic crystal actually, I think it has four of the champs that are in the current featured five star crystal just because those are independent schedules okay um and what they're doing in the old days or in the today days the six star pool in the featured is static until you switch over to the next featured and then you get all of those new champions added so like dr voodoo and the six features and ghost rider and stuff would still be almost 90 days away from being added but now they're saying you know kitty pride's gonna get added maybe next week She's going to be in the basic pool. And then Nimrod, a couple weeks after that, is going to be in the basic pool. So I think that's a positive change yeah. because there is a little bit of like this idea, at least at, at players at a higher level tend to just like save really hard for the features. And then yeah. they're never going for the basic pool. Um, but there may be a small incentive for people to go back in the basic pools, which it's it's a better deal for shards. And it also gives you a chance to pick up some other champions that you don't have. 
Um, and knowing like, hey, Hercules is in there now. Eventually, Kitty Pride's going to be in there in a couple weeks. Nimrod's going to be in there. The crystal's just better and uh, a little bit more attractive. Well, and Campbell, you know, we kind of got sidetracked there. What um, I sidetracked us. I didn't. You didn't get to answer the original question, which was just the future of the game, solo mode, relics. If you feel like this is relates to that at all, what are you excited about? What are your thoughts? Uh, it's pretty open ended. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think. I, I don't want to speak for all three of us, but I do think that all of us enjoy the game a lot right now. Yeah. Um, looking back at 2021, which because it's 2022, that's weird. Um, but yeah, last year, I mean, some of that content that came out, like the Gauntlet and Summer of Pain, and you know, lesser degree, the Karina's Challenges, which was just something for people to chew on and get some really nice rewards. It was one of the best years the contest has ever had in terms of like innovation and stuff that came out. And I personally still really like Alliance War. It, I like the competition and the the jitters you get from it. I like the model of going to a quest and clear paths and kill the boss. But I do think that the game's been around for seven years and they're worried, you know, we're getting to the point where six stars are gonna be ranked four soon. They're gonna probably be six 200 soon across the board rank five is going to be here before we know it then what and this year 2022 i think is going to be a really important one for them to kind of introduce some elements to progress the game so that it's not you know just in oh here's seven stars and here's the same game and it's going to continue down that road for the next seven years so i'm i'm a little scared um gear systems scare me a lot especially if they become overly monetized um so they're really going to have to get these relics right the rewards for the solo competitive mode how that's going to affect progression and competition and things i'm curious if it's just going to be a fun thing on the side where you pick up some scraps or if it's like you need to be killing it in competitive solo mode in order to progress your account like that that's two very different things so yeah, I guess cautiously optimistic is where I would be, but also I do kind of like the game as it is and I don't want to see it change to like become a totally different game. Yeah. Uh, DL, did you have thoughts on that or? Um... Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I'm i definitely hopeful about solo competitive because as you know, I'm a big fan of incursions, but the time required, even if you spread it out over five days relative to the rewards, means that the reason I'm continuing to play them is because I'm a big fan of them. Yeah. Um, if solo competitive can give us that kind of feeling, that, you know, analysis, that thinking on the fly, that you really have to understand the capabilities of your own roster, the capabilities of other champions that you may run into and then make a decision with it quickly like you say that makes you a better player yeah but it's also just fun <laughs> and if they can capture that then i'm really happy about it i do hope that they fix the ability to bring pre-fights because i I've, I've had this argument with people but i do not think that kabam made the conscious choice that Torch, Mr. Fantastic, Sorcerer yeah. Supreme, Storm Pyramid X, every champion that has a pre-fight, just, you know what, they're all too strong, we need to nerf them for solo competitive mode. I think it's just a tech limitation, and so I hope that gets fixed. Yeah. With Relics, um, I am cautiously optimistic because when they were first announced, the way Kabam was talking about them sounded like they were thinking about them the right way um because if they're just giving us things where it's like all right this adds 10 percent to your pi after you grind this event for 10 hours then that's stupid but if they add things where it's like you can get a relic for hyperion that reduce that cuts the time you have to dash back and hold block in half before you get his regen you can get another relic where after you activate his regen his charges come back 25% sooner. You can get, um, I don't know, a relic for Venom Pool that increases the window on when his special two counts as an intercept to be more like Hercules's. You can get like 
extra crit rate for Emma Frost so she builds prowess more quickly without synergies. Like little things like that where you can customize certain kits, make them play differently, and effectively grind for what I would think of as like portable synergies. If they balance it well, that excites the heck out of me. Like that would be really cool. That's one of my favorite things about like role playing games and that kind of thing is building within particular champions. It's like localized masteries almost. I, but then there is, yeah. you know, all the ways it could go wrong. So cautious. Yeah, right. It's almost like if they make them too good and also make them um, like paywalled, then that's not cool. That's like it's almost like you almost feel like you have to have them and you also have to pay a lot of money for them. That's not I don't think that's what anyone's looking for. I really I don't know that person. Uh, I like the idea of what you're saying here, too. Like we all have these champions we enjoy. We're like, oh, if this was a little bit better. And I do feel like there's a lot of champions like that. Uh, I know I bring up America Chavez a lot, uh, but this this isn't just me complaining. This is, I think, a relic, a certain relics with this kind of what you're saying, like an synergy that you just get to take along could significantly increase or where there's champions who just have like a lack of good flow or it feels like maybe if this ability lasted one second longer, two seconds longer, they would not necessarily now become dominant, but they'd be significantly more usable. Uh, I would love it if relics are supplying that sort of thing. And then kind of like you're saying, like the role playing aspect of it all. I, I think that'd be really fun. I think it'd make you feel even more like you really are this summoner with all these champions at your disposal and how you're going to place them out. I think it plays into some really cool uh, things about the game that we already enjoy. Uh, I actually made a note while you were talking here. And I, I ultimately, I think you're right. Like if we were if, if we could place bets on this. I would bet that the pre-fight wasn't necessarily a conscious decision. It just was. This is the, why we can't use pre-fights like an arena or, or it sounds like maybe they weren't in the solo mode. And then you started listing them. And I felt like Torch, Torch was the one that was different for me. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and I am I am going back though, and I'm trying to remember, was he the first champion with a pre-fight? Yeah, he was actually. Mm-hmm. I think I think he was. It, uh, if if we're not, if we're wrong in the comments, please let us know. And I think his is the one that makes me like. That's not like I the one I always go to. The one that I'm I always find myself like. Oh, I wish I could have used them in arena. Is Diablo because it adds a significant amount to his kit, but it it doesn't feel as um, you know. I'm always better with analogies. Torch is one of the champions that we went back and forth on quite a few times on should he be in that like pre 12.0 in the rankings? Because mm -hmm. when you trigger that pre-fight, he's that dominant, right? Like no one's immune to it. Yeah. I I wonder how they handle that. And I, I also wonder if because of him, they don't even try to handle it. They're like, nope, can't use pre-fights. <laughs> we're, we're good. Because yeah, he may have balanced it. it. Yeah. yeah, please. I, I want to hear your guys' thoughts on that. Well, I was just going to say, like, it seems like a lot of people are leaning toward the Mystic champs for their rank ups for the defense portion of the solo competitive mode. You know, just colloquially, he, I'm hearing a lot of like, oh, I'm going to rank my Maw and my Mojo because they're cool, but also yeah. for solo competitive mode. So, yeah, Torch is sort of a trump card when it comes to that matchup. Right. But the thing is that for a lot of those matchups, Torch is every bit as much of a trump card without his pre-fight. And yeah. the thing that bothered, like, because Torch without a pre-fight against Ebony Maw, unless there's like a tenacity node, he is going to curb stomp it. Well, isn't that, but, uh, I'm interrupting you here for a second, but it, yeah. it'll help me and, and everyone else, and then we'll get back, so I apologize. Is okay. is the format of the solo mode, um, you know, you get to pick, I mean, how many defenders do you pick? Is, would so, would deal? would you be able to, like, in just a few uh, minutes or, or shorter, be able to give an overview of what the solo mode we saw was? Like the format of it? I actually can't. <laughs> okay, yeah. I didn't think it was possible. I don't know that much. Uh, don't worry about yeah. it. That's fine. Um, but I, I I wonder about that. I interrupted you. If, if you could get back to your train of thought, I, uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Sorry. I don't... I haven't been paying as close attention to the solo mode. Yeah. But where I was going was that I think in most matchups, Torch actually loses less by taking away his pre-fight then he gains in general by allowing it. Um, if that makes any sense at all, 
But where I'm going with that is that characters like Diablo, like you said, or yeah. Mr. Fantastic, uh, yeah. lose a ton without theirs. Because it is very clear that their kits are built around the ability to use pre-fights. Yeah. And even someone like Storm X, she's immune to shock, but only if you can use that pre-fight. Because otherwise you have to, like, play below 30% health or get knocked down a lot. And, you know, I know your feelings on that. <laughs> and to a lesser degree, War Machine as well. Like I, I yeah. consider War Machine, the complete War Machine is with at least the skirmish and the energy resistance thing, because you keep getting them back when you win a fight. So they're basically infinite pre-fights to the point where I consider that just base kit for him. So if you don't use them, he immediately gets nerfed. I think that's a tough one. I'm really curious where they go. I understand. I believe I understood your point, DL, too, about like the relative value versus relative loss of not having them. And they are champions who these pre-fights are absolutely essential to. Uh, I'm curious how they how they work that out, and if te the tech is an issue in the uh, and this new engine. I, I really feel like Kabam's trying to like build a new game. We can go through the mindset and why and all these things, uh, but I, I, yeah, that's all pure speculation. I truly feel like at some point they're like, we need to fix this. And I reinterpret that as a sign that they feel like this game has many, many years left, right? You don't do all this if you could just keep a bandaid on it if you think it doesn't have a lot of time. So I'm curious yeah. to see where that goes. Um, before we move on, does it, do, was there a point either of you kind of had or wanted to get in on, on kind of solo mode relics? Oh, apparently I am one of those people with another point is I do think this though, I think there's a chance that relics don't devalue the champions themselves, but may devalue crystals. And something I feel like I've noticed is the new six star featured uh, situation and how that's worked out. And with prestige kind of saying relatively static, relatively, that there is much less incentive to pop cav crystals because by and large, you're eventually going to get those six stars anyway at a relatively reasonable pace. Like, I get it. Like, I, I wouldn't have gotten Miguel if I hadn't done calves. I wouldn't have. So I know there's always these, like, exceptions. But I do wonder if that plus relics, because the relics, I hope, I guess what I'm saying here is, I hope the relics don't become essential to the champion. I hope the champion stays very, very valuable. It's a long way around there, but did that make sense? Big agree. I also wonder if that could potentially be an answer to the SIG 200 problem. Where, like, you know, crystals currently, when you dupe a champion, you get shards and iso. What if each rarity had a certain amount of relic shards, so to speak? So that, like, when you max SIG as a six-star champion and you get that overflow... I mean, hopefully they would throw in like some six star shards as well, yeah. but maybe they also throw in like a significant amount of whatever currency we use to build relics. And then that might keep the crystals important. But then not, but not locked to that, right? Like that's not the only way to get right. the Definitely relic. Definitely not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What I, to me, that sounds really cool. What do you uh, think, Campo? I, I have never thought of it that way, and I think that that could be really cool for sure. Um, yeah, I think relics relics are going to become kind of a necessary evil or a necessary positive thing that happens, just because I like I can very much recall when the six stars started becoming more dominant, and you know you used to use this example all the time of like having the max sig five star doom. And then you pull the six star and you yeah. have that uh, feeling at first. And then you're like, okay, well, I can start working on this doom. But th it takes a while to get that new champion up. And the fact that a lot of people have doom now, six 200, six star rank three or rank four. And there's a way to take that champion you've been working on and add to them slightly instead of starting from scratch. I think that's the main thing that relics are going to be able to do if, if implemented correctly. So... Yeah, let's see what they do. See very, how this works out. Very cool. Um, I actually may pass that idea along to Kabam. Uh, I think those are really good ideas. All right, and then this was kind of our, I, I think it's our final topic for today. 
is uh, Kang, right? Um, you know, I, I think because of, of people not really having him, he was considered just a trophy champion. Then the synergy with Apocalypse came in. Uh, the evolution of that was, no, you need Apocalypse uh, ramped right away. You want the four genetic code. So Cable um, was an essential thought. You know, a lot of people thought this. Cable is excellent with Apocalypse. So that worked out fine. No one's really even thinking about Kang. Uh, and then and then uh, we had the gifting event. And more people now have access to Kang. We're starting to see him being used. He is impressive. Like, I'm not... At no point am I going to deny that the things King can do are impressive. I do think some of that is because we held him in such low regard originally. And let me be clear, this is King with Apocalypse. Without Apocalypse, he's not good, right? Um, and so I'm getting questions on this. Like, I actually just put out a rank video today. I ranked up three champions and a, a lot of it was like war themed. I'm very excited about the war season starting. And I even made a comment in there. It was like, I would be kind of tempting to rank up King. I think it'd be a lot of fun. But in my head, I kept thinking, there's no way, uh, and you guys know I, I, my BG leaders are Taters and Lizer. There's no way they're going to assign me King. Because not only does it mean I'm using King, but I have to have Apocalypse too. And although I'm not a war planner, I kept thinking that is way too much to ask a war planner to do while also planning paths for nine other people while trying to efficiently and safely and as powerfully uh, attack this defense. So that's my thought on it. I'm not a war planner though. And you two are, it, 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 I'm less concerned about like confirming what I thought or telling me I'm wrong. How does that, how does that play out for you uh, with Kang in general and then also with questing and then definitely as war planners? I will, and we'll start with well, DLL. Well, I do think that Kang looks impressive, but in my mind, he kind of fills a similar slot to one of my favorite rank fives that I have, which is Winter Soldier. Because when you have Killmonger on the team, he turns into basically a high sig Star Lord for those first hundred hits, which is always enough. He has power drain on crits. If you get lucky with it, it's actually better than Kang's power control. And then he has really great damage over time. Like, there are things he can do that look really impressive. Every time I've played him on stream with that synergy, people are surprised. And so I always filter the surprise and, you know, recognition Kang gets through that lens. Is like, is this actually better than Winter Soldier, who I have never once thought to assign in war? Or is it just like, oh, okay, cool, big numbers? And I kind of lean more towards big numbers because power drain is the worst kind of power control. Not for like a moral reason, but because the characters that we currently run into on defense and the way the map is currently set up just punishes it more. There's power bond. There are champions that are immune to power drain, especially from tech champions. It just is weaker than steel or lock or burn or other kinds of control. And so you're going to find fewer places to use it. And then the other big thing that Kang has is like, yeah, he can have really high armor values, but he only has that high armor value if you're not using his power control utility because it's based on stored power and it's only armor. It only becomes energy resistance if you also have War Machine pre-fights, at which point I kind of wonder, shouldn't you just be using War Machine? <laughs> and so like, I'm not going to say that I would never assign a rank 3 Kang, because I do, I'm very careful saying this, but I do have in my memory spots where I'm like, man, it would be really nice if we could get Apocalypse to four charges right away there so that we could then make Archangel a horseman on the same team. But if the third spot goes to Cable, then we have three mutant nukes. And we really need to counter that, I don't know, let's say Havoc for the easiest possible example. Or maybe like, we need a power control champion for this character on the lane, and Cable Archangel Apocalypse just can't do that. Kang could. 
So I'm not going to say that I would never assign him, but it would have to be an incredibly rare path. And I don't think, like, I think rank three low sig would be enough any time that I would use it. Okay. And what about you, Campo? Um, I know, you know, you are, you're in the same BG, you're in the same alliance, but you are different people. Uh, do you have different thoughts at all on Kang, assigning him, and that sort of thing? I pretty much agree with DLL on this. I think he pretty much hammered everything home as well. Um, the only other thing I would say is that, you know, if you everything that Kang does is buffs, you know, like the Furies are active buffs, the armor is active buffs, and there's plenty of nodes that punish that. So that immediately takes him out of anything that's like power snack, um, which, you know, is something that you may want power control for as well. And he doesn't have any immunities. So it's like, if you really want a powerful tech champion that can have a reliable power drain, maybe you want to use the tech collar mastery type of thing. I'm going to vision age of Ultron, you know? Yeah. So for that utility, and then the damage is pretty cool because it's Kang and he was used to be meme tier and now you're seeing big yellow numbers. So like I'm, I'll be the first one to admit that is fun. And I am a lucky enough person to have a six star unduped Kang and I've used him in act seven even just for a little bit of fun. Um, but when the match really matters, I'm not sure I'm picking him. And I think that kind of hammers home what DLL was saying. Um, and then the last thing is a planner, which was sort of you know you started saying vega was like you know you have to consider the nine other players and if you're encumbering war machine and apocalypse to use kang and not use apocalypse or war machine because the goal is to use kang then you're not only wasting two slots on one team but you're potentially encumbering the other nine members of the battle group um so yeah it, it's just a war plan is a complicated living organism that requires a lot of thought and Kang can be a tool, but certainly not a go-to and probably not even on DLL's like second tier or whatever. He'd probably be closer to an honorable mention, uh, third tier champ to me. Yeah. So, uh, if I just listen to you guys, this feels like, um, as far as war is concerned, this feels almost like he's a synergy champ that can maybe take a fight, like not, uh, so not necessarily Sabretooth, but this isn't like, um, this definitely isn't Cable and Apocalypse because we've shown how many fights Cable can take and how quickly he can knock things down. And this isn't even really Penny and, and, uh, and, um, and Falcon because they both can obviously take fights. I'm not sure how many, uh, Dale, you went over Penny a little bit in your last video, right? And you were kind of yeah. had her on like your eye I, on. We actually assigned her this war and oh. she did great. Um, really? I think the way that I would think about him in terms of a synergy is kind of somewhere in between Hood and Joe fix it for Kingpin. <laughs> Which trust me, I don't think many people want to be in that in that uh chasm between <laughs> right. And I do I do want to clarify that the reason I'm putting him below Hood is because I personally rank Hood yeah. fairly highly. I, I think he's yeah. quite good and underrated. I still don't have a very good opinion of, of Joe, so that's what the laughter was for. <laughs> yes, and that's that's fair. But I yeah. should clarify that because I'm not saying between useless and useless. I'm saying between yeah. quite good and useless. But then, uh, but Campbell, <laughs> you've used him in questing. Like I, I can see. Not only is he fun because of like you said the meme tier, it's like the zero to hero, but you actually can do things. So like. Uh, we'll probably this month in February will be the first month he shows up on the tier list because people actually have him now. Where uh, and I realize you don't have the whole tier list memorized and all the categories and all that stuff, but where would you uh, just off off the cuff? Like I, I know you didn't know I was going to ask you this question. Where would you place him? Uh, and assuming that we have the synergy designation, uh, he has to have apocalypse. I mean, I'm tempted to just put him in call um, okay. because. He can take any fight that is sort of a run of the mill fight um, because power drain, it just helps you keep your rhythm and he hits hard enough with physical hard damage. And if he's duped, he has a little bit of protection with the armor. But I do feel like if there's anything happening in the fight, um, he's not going to really supersede any other tech. So he'd probably be like low premium if you just consider damage 
utility unto itself or maybe call. Um, I'm going to try to force him into some of Act 7.4, but it's uh, that's the key is I, I feel like I'm going to be forcing him in just to maybe get a video. <laughs> and that's not for, for story content. That's fine. But for stuff that other people are depending you on, i.e. war, yeah. you know, that's not necessarily what the champ you want. And what about you, Dale? Do you have kind of like some final thoughts on on, on and basically? Because remember, the tier list is really rank up advice. Right. Uh, I think I'd be comfortable putting him in premium because, yeah. like, like we talked about, especially when you're talking about content where you can bring five people, like being able to bring Apocalypse Kang, maybe make somebody else a Horseman, maybe you bring Venom Pool for your Cosmic because his synergy with Kang is actually quite good for him, you know. Those kinds of little team building things, I would be like, sure, I'll bring him as my brute force character. Because I've brought Winter Soldier for that exact reason on teams before, to just make Killmonger a little bit stronger. And then I run into a fight where I'm like, hmm, nobody, ha nobody I have really counters this. Let me just parry five hit combo and assume the other person is going to die first. Yeah, Winter Soldier is really good for that. If Kang is making the rest of your team better, then sure, bring him, bring him for those. Maybe the power drain or the armor comes up. I feel like premium fits. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I agree. And I should know the tier list really well. And I had just asked both of you. So we'll talk more about it at length and then get him placed on February uh, edition. I, um, I actually think I'm going to do a Synergy All-Stars on Venom Pool. I ranked him up recently. And his synergies and the partners in there are just so good. Like he's very configurable. And these are- It makes me smile every time I read the list. It's yeah. so good. Like it's these are- It's basically DLL's rank threes are synergies. <laughs> 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 Need to get me a platinum pool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I can see we've gone oh, pretty much an hour and I was like, oh, we'll do about 30 minutes. Uh, so here we are. Uh, I think this was chock full of information, though. I know I absolutely enjoyed this. Um, people who've watched it, thank you so much for watching. If you have comments or ideas, because I do believe in this, I think this is really good. It's something we used to do when I was streaming a bit more, but I think having it be in like a, what is it called, like video on demand format makes a ton of sense. Uh, we have very, very smart people on the phone here with me. Uh, and I would like to give you each a chance to like, is there any other topic you wanted to cover or, or, or last kind of uh, wisdom to impart or anything like that? Uh, we'll start with, uh, with uh, Campo. Uh, I think just a comment, like I'm, I'm really excited for February and beyond um, because there's, there's a lot of talk right now. I've heard in chats and on videos about, oh, January is so dead. I don't think we're going to get two months without major developments in the game. Um, and I have no information or anything about what's coming, but given everything that happened with the influx of resources from gifting, I'm just excited for what comes next um, before Relics, like when we get some more classic content, whether that's 7.4, whether that's more Karina's challenges, whether that's the return of the gauntlet for people that didn't finish it. Uh, I'm just, I'm ready for something to chew on and, and hopefully, uh, the other summoners are as well. Yeah, I'm definitely ready for new content. I am so happy to have war back as stressful as the first yeah. one was <laughs> shaking off all the rust. Um, yeah, this is just, it's my favorite game mode. It's good to get back into it. I'm glad to have that, but I am looking forward to other content. Like I just took Cersei to rank three. I... I want to see where she fits in in new challenges. Awesome. 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 All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. I really do appreciate you being on the call. Um, guys, go to the description. Look at it. They're in the, the rankings team. They're already there with their channels. But also, I'll provide a, a, a cool video that they've each put out this week that I think really highlights just how awesome they are. If you're not already subscribed, I cannot urge you enough. These are channels I watch to get better at this game. I, I do it all the time. I go to the subscription screen. Have they uploaded a new video? If they have, I watch it almost immediately. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for being here. Um, and I think we'll be signing off. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. I hope you either learned something, were entertained, or even better, a little bit of both. Don't forget to like, subscribe, 
Thanks so much for watching. Take care.